Tara Vanderveer remembers hearing a story about how NASA engineers prepared for the 1969 moon landing. They had a big picture of the moon, and that was just a visual to help the scientists and everyone. That the goal was to land a person on the moon. Here, men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon. A quarter of a century later, Tara was named the head coach of the U.S. women's basketball team. I said, well, for our team, you know, our goal was win a gold medal. So Tara got creative. Nine months before the 96 Olympics, Tara decided to take her players on a field trip. Basically, I told our team, you know, someone is going to win this gold medal and let's make sure it's us and let's practice every single thing to get ready for it, including the medal ceremony. Cheryl Swoops remembers that day well. You know, Tara's talking on the bus, telling us where we're going, and all of us at the time were like, okay. The bus arrived at the Georgia Dome, where the gold medal game would be held on August 4th, 1996. She didn't turn on the lights, and she had them put their pictures up on the big screen, and, like, she really wanted them to see the experience that they were going to have at the end of this road. That's Michelle Smith-McDonald. She's been covering women's basketball since the mid-'90s. She had the whole thing set up. It was just this elaborate visualization exercise for a group of players that, in theory, probably you would think don't need that kind of motivation, but to have them do it together and walk them into that physical space, I think was really important for her to get them to feel the way they needed to feel about this. The players were led down to the field and asked to visualize a basketball court. And so she said, close your eyes. We didn't question anything, right? So we all closed our eyes and she said, imagine this is where you are. We're standing on the metal stand. And, you know, she just said, think about, I don't know, millions of fans just cheering us on. One of the veteran players brought the gold medals she won in 84 and 88 so that her teammates could experience what it felt like to bend down as gold medals were placed around their necks. Tara was always very big on visualization. And to be honest with you, I never really got into that until that moment. And then Tara asked her players to imagine something else. <sighs> what does it feel like not being on the top? And none of us ever wanted to feel that. So we were like, I don't know. We don't know what that feels like. We don't know what second or third feels like because we don't do that, right? From that moment on, the only thing we could think about and the only thing we could imagine was always being the best and always being on the top and always finishing first. We never, even, even today, we don't have a conversation about not bringing home gold. Nine months later, in the opening days of the 96 Olympics, the U.S. women's gymnastics team would make history by winning team gold. At that point, the basketball, softball, and soccer teams would just be getting started on their Olympic quest, and nothing short of gold would do. From Dear Media and Together, I'm Michelle Kwan, and this is Summer of Gold. This is Episode 5, Give Me Mine. The International Olympic Committee... When the IOC awarded the 1996 Olympics to Atlanta, the city went crazy. But the U.S. women's soccer team didn't play their preliminary games in Georgia. They were a bit further south, in Florida. Julie Foudy says it was not ideal. I just remember playing the early stage games and them not being completely sold out, which we were like, aww. 
And it was a good crowd, but we were thinking, you know, packed huge orange bowl. And, but it's hard because we were so far away. We were in Florida. After winning all three of their preliminary games, the soccer team traveled to Athens, Georgia. Athens is a little more than an hour east of Atlanta. And that's when the team realized what a big deal it was to be playing in front of a home crowd. Everywhere we went, when we would be training or we would be walking back from practice, everywhere we went, when they'd see our team, they would literally stop and start singing the national anthem or chanting wherever you went, USA. I mean, it didn't matter where you were, out you know, in downtown Athens, the little town, people everywhere would stop and sing to you. The team would face Norway in the semis. We had lost the prior World Cup the summer before to Norway in brutal fashion. And they do this little centipede crawl around us and to rub it in some more. And it was scarred on our memory and seared on our memory. I hated them, but I loved them. I loved playing against them. It was so fun to hate them so much. That's Michelle Akers. And they were relentless. So it was like, you know, we had to be razor sharp the entire game. When the team headed into the locker room at halftime, Norway was up one goal to none. I can remember just a calmness in the locker room. There was no panic. There was no frenzied, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It was, we got this. We have them right where we want them. They're done. Let's finish them off this time. It's always easy to be confident when you're winning and things are going well, but when the shit hits the fan, then then how do you react? And that was the moment that I'm like, oh, we're good. The game went into overtime, but in the end, the U.S. won. Now just one game stood between the U.S. women's soccer team and their first ever Olympic gold medal. To say that the U.S. softball team was favored to win gold in Atlanta would be an understatement. In international play over the previous decade, they'd won more than 100 games, and they'd only lost once. But things don't always go exactly as planned, especially at the Olympics. You know, there's so many things going on in the Olympics. There's so much stress. There's so much pressure. We're the number one team in the world. The expectations, managing all that. That's Michelle Smith. She was a pitcher for the U.S. softball team, and she's not related to women's basketball writer Michelle Smith McDonald. The team won their first five Olympic matchups with a combined score of 33 to 2. Their sixth game was against Australia. The trouble began in the fifth inning. Danny Tyler, one of our younger athletes on the team who was playing second base, hit a home run, a solo home run. And when she came around to step on home plate she actually missed home plate she stepped over it because she was high-fiving some of our teammates and and the umpire saw it australia saw it so she was called out without that home run the game went into extra innings and in the bottom of the 10th with the u.s up by one pitcher lisa fernandez faced australian joe brown lisa and joe had been teammates at ucla and in all their years playing with and against each other Joe had never hit a home run off a pitch Lisa had thrown. And she had two strikes on the batter, and she threw a pitch a little bit too sweet. Joe Brown hit a home run, winning the game for Australia. Was it shocking? Absolutely. Was it something we thought we could come back from? Absolutely. Despite the loss, the U.S. qualified for the semifinals. And if anything, losing a game only increased the media frenzy surrounding the team. At the center of it all was future orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Dot Richardson. It just kept growing and growing and more media in the media tent and more attention, more attention. The team's semifinal was sold out. Dot heard that people were scalping tickets for the final. When that day finally arrived. It was so hot. Humidity was full, 100%. It was like unbelievable, but it was a full house. As Dot was walking onto the field for that game, she was reminded of how long it had taken for softball to make its Olympic debut, and all the women who had missed out on this moment. Before the game, you know, we usually sign autographs really fast, right, and toss balls back to the stands, and I got a ball, and I was ready to sign it, and I heard, no, don't sign it. 
And I turned and looked and it was Judy Hall, who was a teammate of mine with the Orlando Rebels. And she said, it's for you. The Orlando Rebels were the semi-pro team Dot had joined when she was 13. And I started reading the names on the ball. Joan Joyce, Irene Shea, Marge Ricker. I mean, these legends in the game. And I have to admit, and I'm not a big crier, right? A tear kind of came from my eye because it was like, it hit me that we're living the dream for all of those that were deserving to be called Olympians, but weren't. They're in it with us. For the third time in four days, the U.S. would face China. Because they were our last round robin, then we had to play them in the semifinal, and then they worked their way back into the championship games. That's Michelle Smith again. And, you know, it's hard at that elite level to beat anybody three games in a row. Michelle should have known better than to be worried, especially with Dr. Dot on her team. Dot Richardson is like a six foot three person jammed into that five foot two or three <laughs> uh, frame of hers with all this explosive energy. And all the years I played with her and against her, I'd never really seen her hit home runs. But man, she was just pumped up in the Olympics. During the final, Dot hit a home run that nearly sparked an international incident. So she's up to bat. She pulls a ball down the line. Being a left-handed hitter, the way the ball hooked around the foul line, it left the yard fair. And then when it hit the ground, it looked like it was a foul ball. Chinese officials contested the home run. The protest dragged on for nine minutes. Michelle says she knew the ball had been fair, but still, she was worried. The game is so fast, too, and everything happens so quickly. And at the time, there wasn't replay. So you're hoping that there's six umpires, you know, one on each base and then two down the lines, that they're going to get that right. And, and they did. They did get it right. With Dot's homer on the board, the U.S. won the gold medal. It was a lot of chaos, everyone running together. And it was a big dog pile. I just remember looking back at pictures and my big hair flying and we're all laying on top of each other in the middle of the dirt infield and just hearing the crowds yell and, and chant. It was probably one of the most special moments of my life. As she climbed to the top of the podium to receive her gold medal, Dot Richardson thought back to the moments before the game when she was given that softball signed by her former teammates. I felt so small. It wasn't, look what I've done or what we've done. It was like, I felt, I was so humbled because I realized there were so many deserving to be Olympians and were never given the chance. And we fulfilled that dream for them. And I hope they felt it. But we also opened the door of opportunities for other young girls to dream it, to dream big. For many young softball players, this was their see-it-be-it moment. But the 96 games weren't over yet, and there would be more see-it-be-it moments to come. For more than a year, the women's basketball team had done everything they could to prepare for the games. But the morning of their first game, two of the team's starters were too nervous to eat breakfast. Cheryl Swoops didn't really feel the nerves until later when she walked out onto the court. I just remember kind of going through warm-ups, talking to myself, saying, you're here for a reason. Like, for me, like, you belong. I was one of the youngest ones on the team in just telling myself, you're, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. So go, go do what you do. As the U.S. worked their way through the tournament, Cheryl realized that she might have been nervous, but she wasn't worried. There was never a moment when I felt like we weren't, we weren't going to win. We were prepared. We were over-prepared. That's Dawn Staley. In 96, she was the backup guard, but today, she's Team USA's coach. So it was just basically by how many like how, how many points we're going to win you know how many great plays how many unselfish plays are we going to make for me how many behind the back passes how many between the legs and it was nothing disrespectful to our opponents it had everything to do with what we had gone through and for everything that we had to do for our future 
The basketball team knew they had a lot more than just gold medals on the line. Two women's pro leagues, the WNBA and the ABL, were in the works. But the U.S. had never had one successful women's pro basketball league, let alone two. And if Cheryl Swoops, Dawn Staley, and the rest of the team were to have a chance to play in the U.S., they were going to need to put on a show during the Olympic Games. We always thought about that, like, who's here? Who's here today? Who's watching today? So even when the team was winning by 20 points or 40 points, they didn't let up. There was one fan in particular Cheryl Swoops wanted to please, David Stern. He was the commissioner of the NBA, and Cheryl knew the WNBA would need his full support if it were to survive. For us, it was a matter of showing Commissioner Stern, God rest his soul, why we needed to have a professional league, right? And if we're able to not only win, but show Commissioner Stern and everyone else how good we are, how strong we are, how tough we are, how competitive we are, how beautiful we are. I think that that was the pressure we put on ourselves. Women's soccer was still years away from getting its first pro league. But when Julie Foudy walked onto the field for the Olympic final, she was amazed. We had played in front of large crowds outside of our country, but we had never played actually in front of a sold-out crowd like that, almost 80,000, 76,481. It was the largest crowd ever at a women's soccer game. 76,481. <laughs> That's goalkeeper Brianna Scurry. We had, you know, decent crowd sizes before, but nothing that big for all the marbles. American flags everywhere, super loud, super rowdy. It was not like, you know, you typically see finals and Olympics or World Cups being very corporate, quieter. This was young kids, families, flags, painted faces, shirts off, USA, males, females, didn't matter. It was something we'd never experienced in that way. The U.S. was facing China. The game was really good. I had forgotten how good it was. We score early, China equalizes, we go in at halftime, it's 1-1. And then in the second half, Joy Fawcett, our right back, amazing player, makes this great run forward. She gets to the end line. Instead of shooting it, she looks across, plays a perfectly way to pass into Tiffany Milbert, who taps it in. Michelle Akers remembers exactly what she was feeling as the final whistle blew. Such relief. It's like, oh, thank God. Like, oh, I can exhale, you know, the entire time you've been holding your breath. The players sprinted towards each other and gathered in midfield. I have this picture. Somebody sent it to me, all the Orlando Sentinel, and it just shows me, like, standing on the field with my arms up in the air, like, like, yes! And then being able to stand on the top of the podium and sing the national anthem terribly together and scream it, really, not sing it. So that moment when we all stood up onto the podium holding hands is something that still gives me the chills. I'm like, oh, gosh. Julie felt like this was the moment that would finally make Americans care about women's soccer. And you only get so many of these moments. And as female athletes, this is what you get the most, right? Those windows are finite and they're super small and they're fast. They come and they go. And you've got to really make sure that you maximize that exposure. You want the sport to blossom. You want young kids to see that and be inspired and play and grow. But this was not going to be soccer's moment. From the start, the team knew that NBC wouldn't air all of their games. We assumed, I did, that if it's a semi or final, then hello. And, you know, it it was soccer, but USA was in the final. So we figured we would be, I figured we'd be, you know, the, the team to watch that night. But as soon as the game was over, the players started getting phone calls from friends. Saying, you know, I couldn't catch it. And we were like, what? What do you mean you couldn't catch it? I remember hearing that my friends and family that weren't there didn't see any of it, except for the little bits and highlights, which don't really count. 
And then reporters started saying it was only aired for, you know, a few minutes. NBC would replay a segment, maybe, you know, a minute or two. Quick cutaways from preliminary diving. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Diving's great, but preliminary diving versus a packed stadium. After all their hard work to grow and publicize women's soccer, after playing their hearts out and beating a top team from China, only the 76,481 people in attendance had gotten to see the game. And it was incredible energy in that stadium. I mean, imagine, you know, almost 80,000 people, all American fans. It's a U.S. final. Like, by today's standards, they'd cover that on 17 different channels, right? So that was tough. Four years later, during the Sydney Olympics, NBC Sports Chairman Dick Ebersole pulled Julie and a couple of her teammates into his office. And he said, I need to say something to you three. And we said, what's up, Dick? And he goes, "Uh, I just want to apologize for what was one of the worst decisions I've made in my career, I think. I just want you to know how much I regret it, how much I'm sorry for us not showing more of that final. We were like, oh, thank you. The games would soon be coming to a close, but there was one more big game to play with the gold medal and the future of women's professional basketball on the line. The women's basketball gold medal game was scheduled for the very last day of the Olympics. It was USA versus Brazil. Dawn Staley was not worried. I felt like there is nothing, there is nothing, nothing will separate us from having more points in Brazil at the end of this game. We were armed with so much talent, so much togetherness. I mean, we, we had everything we needed. Cheryl Swoops might have had a slightly more realistic view. Brazil in 96, I would say, was definitely our our toughest competition. I knew how tough that matchup was going to be. They were always exciting. We always knew that it was going to be a battle. And sometimes people may look at the score, right, and say, well, it was a high score game. Or, you know, you guys ended up beating them by, I don't know, I'm just saying 20 points or so. You know, and I'm like, well, maybe we did. But the game was a lot tougher and closer than 20 points. The U.S. didn't beat Brazil by 20 points. They beat them by 24. Dawn remembers exactly what she said as the gold medal was being hung around her neck. (laughs) I just said, give me mine. Like, give me mine. And it was one of the most incredible moments because it's it's a lifelong dream and goal of mine to do it. I was 26 years old at the time. I was sitting on top of the world, and I was doing it with the people that I absolutely love doing it with and created a sisterhood that won't ever be broken. But when asked about that moment, Cheryl Swoops paused for a long time. I mean, it felt great, right? You expect me to say that. To be very honest with you, my first thought was man, I can't wait to do this in four more years. Like, that was my first thought. And then Cheryl started thinking about other things, like how hard the team's barnstorming tour had been, all the time she had thought about quitting. There were so many things going through my mind when I was standing there, like, I made it, I did it, we did it. So you celebrate for a minute, and then it becomes, okay, now what? Right? Like, what's what's next? What's going to happen? Was David Stern pleased? Was, was he happy? Are we going to have a league? Atlanta was never just about the gold medals. All that hard work and preparation, it was about something bigger. For many, the 96 Olympics would be seen as a turning point for women's sports. The moment when the media finally paid attention to female athletes 
when TV executives learned to ignore women at their own peril, when sponsorship dollars really started to flow. But the road would be rocky, and the road would be long, and it wouldn't always travel in a straight line. Coming up on the final episode of Summer of Gold. Every single iota of progress in women's sports has had to be fought for and earned by these athletes. It was always just, okay, we should just be happy with the money we have. So can we just get like, you know, maybe an extra meal or like, you know, something small. When I got on that executive committee and it was this time for negotiations, it was like, no, we got to go big. It's about... Here's the standard we want to set for all women in all industries and in all silos. And we're going to plant this flag because we think it's that important. We had some serious things that needed to be discussed and some things that were hard to talk about. But if you don't start saying anything, that cycle just keeps repeating itself. 